Hey, 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 hey. Welcome, Bills Mafia, to another edition of Bills or Bust Podcast. I'm Thomas Murphy, and this will be our third installment of the history of the Buffalo Bills. After Buffalo won the last AFL championship of the non-Super Bowl era after the 1965 season, major changes were underway. After feeling there was little left to conquer in professional football, head coach Lou Saban jumped ship to the University of Maryland. The Bills' only GM in their franchise history, Dick Gallagher, also resigned and would later become the director of the Pro Football Hall of Fame from 1968 to 1976. The head coaching reins would be turned over to Joe Collier, the linebacker and defensive back coach of what had been a very successful Bills defense the previous years. Despite the coaching changes, the 1966 Bills were still a force in the AFL. The Bills defense gave up the fewest points in the AFL for the third consecutive year, as Jim Dunaway and Ron McDowell stepped up for injured superstar defensive lineman Tom Sestak. The halfback trio of Bobby Burnett, Bobby Crockett, and veteran Ray Carlton teamed up with quarterback Jack Kemp and wide receiver Albert Dubenian to have the AFL's second highest scoring offense. Burnett would go on to win that year's AFL Rookie of the Year. The Bills would finish the 1966 regular season a respectable 9-4-1. However, their two-year reign as AFL defending champs would come to an abrupt end right before the first ever Super Bowl. The Kansas City Chiefs destroyed the Bills in War Memorial Stadium 31-7. The sole Bills score was a Kemp 69-yard touchdown strike to Dubenian, but Hank Stram's Chiefs were way too dominant and earned the opportunity to lose to Vince Lombardi's Packers in Super Bowl I. Joe Collier's second season as head coach would be disastrous, as 1967 would begin a fall from grace in the AFL for the Bills. Despite few player losses, the Bills would finish 4-10 in 1967, and that would be as good as it got for a handful of years. This would mark their first losing season since 1961. It would not be long until the Bills saw another losing season, as 1968 was an unmitigated disaster. Joe Collier was fired after an 0-2 start, and defensive back coach Harvey Johnson was named the interim head coach. Bills legendary running back Ray Carlton was cut during the preseason, making Albert Dubenian the only remaining Bill from the inaugural 1960 season. As injuries took a toll on Kemp and backup quarterback Tom Flores, who would go on to win two Super Bowls as head coach of the Oakland Raiders in his future. The QB duties were shifted to Dan Dara, a 13th round pick that year out of William & Mary. Eventually, Dan Dara and another backup quarterback, future NFL coach Kay Stevenson, would get injured. This led to the decision to have running back Ed Rutkowski finish the year at quarterback. The Bills ended the 1968 season 1-12-1. 1968 would mark the last year in Buffalo for linebacker Marty Schottenheimer, who would become a longtime head coach later in his career, mainly for the Kansas City Chiefs. So despite the horrific season result, this 1968 team would provide the training ground for several future head coaches. Oddly enough, the Bills' only victory would come against the New York Jets and Joe Namath, who ended up winning the third Super Bowl ever that season. And let me repeat that to all of our younger listeners. The New York Jets have won a Super Bowl. The 1-12-1 record would be the Bills' worst one on record, a dubious honor only to be topped a few years later. It would lead to the Bills getting the first overall pick in the 1969 NFL Draft. They would go on to select a man who would eventually change the dynamic of their struggling team and become more notorious in his post-NFL years as one of the most controversial humans in American history. And with the first pick in the 1969 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills selected Orenthal James Simpson, running back USC, although he is more commonly referred to as OJ to this day. O.J. Simpson signed a four-year contract for $215,000 as the first overall pick, a four-year salary nearly eight times less than yearly veteran minimum today. The Bills replaced interim coach Harvey Johnson with former Raiders head coach John Rausch 
who brought the Raiders to Super Bowl II in 1967. The result was slightly better than the previous year, but not by much. The Bills would finish the 1969 season 4-10. and OJ would have a decent rookie season with over a thousand yards from scrimmage and five total touchdowns. One of the four wins would come versus the Miami Dolphins, a victory they would have to savor, as another victory versus their division rival would be a long time coming. In 1970, the AFL would officially merge with the NFL and the Bills would become part of the American Football Conference, better known as the AFC. The decade of the 70s would start off with a whimper, setting the tone for most of the decade. Before the 1970 season, the Bills would draft O.J. Simpson's good college buddy Al Cowlings, who in the future would be better known as A.C., linebacker out of USC with the fifth overall pick. In the second round, the Bills selected quarterback Dennis Shaw from San Diego State. Shaw was drafted to become the heir apparent to Jack Kemp, who retired to start his successful career in politics. O.J. would play only eight games, and Coach Roush had him blocking more than expected. The Bills would finish 3-10-1 with the one bright spot being Dennis Shaw winning NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year. It was around 1971 where owner Ralph Wilson flirted with the idea of moving the Bills to either Seattle, Tampa, or Memphis unless the city of Buffalo built a new stadium to replace the crumbling War Memorial Stadium. 1971 would bring Buffalo its worst record in history, 1-13, which fortunately still stands today. Former interim head coach Harvey Johnson took over for Roush. Dennis Shaw would decline in his sophomore year, and OJ would have a much more solid year this year than he did the previous. Former Bills interim head coach Harvey Johnson took over full-time as head coach for Roush. Dennis Shaw would decline in his sophomore campaign, and OJ had a much more productive year in his third year. That record would earn the Bills the first overall draft pick in 1972, where they would draft defensive end Walt Patulski out of Notre Dame, but more notably guard Reggie McKenzie out of Michigan in the second round. Lou Saban would return to coach the Bills in 1972 and make them slightly more competitive at 4-9-1, the last season the Bills recorded a tie. Saban would rush OJ more than Roush had, and OJ's rushing career would only take off from there. The threat of losing the Bills forced the city of Buffalo to hasten the production of the new stadium in Orchard Park. Rich Products signed a 25-year $1.5 million deal for the naming rights, which comes to about $60,000 a year, about a million dollars less than the naming rights price today. By 1973, Saban was able to get the Bills back to a level of respectability. Before the season, the Bills would draft Paul Seymour, tight end out of Michigan, with the seventh overall pick. But the last pick of the round, 26th pick Joe DeLamular, offensive guard out of Michigan State, would eventually go down as a Bills legend. In the third round, the Bills would select Joe Ferguson, quarterback out of Arkansas. These would be key components of the high-motored Bills offense come to be known as the Electric Company. OJ would break the NFL rushing yards in a season record, becoming the first to break the 2,000-yard barrier. While five others would reach that season mark after him, OJ remains the only one to do it in the 14-game NFL season era. Despite the first winning season since 1966, the Bills failed to make the playoffs with a 9-5 record. This 1973 Bills team would be featured as a classic team on the video game Madden 96, highlighted by the famous Electric Company. A 9-5 record, however, would be enough to snap the seven-year playoff drought in 1974. Playoff appearance would be short and unmemorable, as the eventual champion Steelers would steamroll over the Bills, 32-14. The 74 team would feature five Pro Bowlers, OJ, guards Joe DeLamuleur and Reggie McKenzie, and defensive backs Robert James and Tony Green would all be honored. The 1975 Bills would miss the playoffs despite their third consecutive winning season at 8-6. It would turn out to be the last winning season of the 1970s for Buffalo. Lou Saban would resign five games into the 1976 season, with offensive line coach Jim Ringo taking over. Ringo would not win one game the rest of the year, and the Bills finished 2-12. Joe Ferguson was injured midway through the season and backup quarterback Gary Mangini proved to be beyond ineffective. 
Inner turmoil would grip the team as OJ became disgruntled with his contract status. The sole highlight of the 76 season would be OJ breaking the single game rushing record on Thanksgiving versus Detroit with 273 rushing yards. Of course, the Bills still lost that game 27 to 14. The low light would be OJ being ejected versus New England weeks earlier in a fist fight against Patriots defensive end Mel Lunsford. 1977 would be OJ's last season as a Bill, as he'd be traded to San Francisco after the season for multiple draft picks. And despite Joe Ferguson leading the NFL in passing yards, still the only Bill in history to do so, Bills finished an unacceptable 3-11. A slight upswing would start in 1978 as the Bills would sign former Rams coach Chuck Knox, the 1973 NFL's Coach of the Year. Bills acquired wide receiver Frank Lewis from Pittsburgh, and fifth overall draft pick Terry Miller would eclipse over 1,000 yards rushing in his rookie year. Bills would finish 5-11 in the NFL's first 16-game regular season. Despite 1979 first overall draft pick linebacker Tom Cousineau out of Ohio State never playing a down for Buffalo, the 1979 draft would shape the Bills for the next few seasons. Fifth overall pick wide receiver Jerry Butler from Clemson, second round pick defensive tackle Fred Smurlis out of Boston College, and linebacker Jim Hazlitt from Indiana, Pennsylvania would go on to make future Pro Bowls. With three games left, the Bills would be 7-6 and six with a shot to make the playoffs. However, they dropped the last three to finish 1979, 7-9. Hazlitt would go on to win Defensive Rookie of the Year. The Bills would not defeat the Miami Dolphins once the entire decade of the 1970s. Fortunately, what would become known as the streak would be stopped at 20 games the very first game of the 1980s. The Bills would defeat the Dolphins 17-7, despite five Joe Ferguson interceptions. The Bills would have the number one defense in the NFL, thanks to what became known as the Bermuda Triangle, which consisted of Smurless, Hazlitt, and linebacker Shane Nelson. The Bills would not let their foot off the gas the rest of the season. They'd finish 11-5, winning their first ever AFC East crown. The playoff run would be short, as they would lose to the Chargers 20-14 in a divisional round. Still, Chuck Knox would win 1980's NFL Coach of the Year. Expectations were high entering 1981. However, the Bills barely snuck into the playoffs with a 10-6 record. 1981 would bring the Bills their first playoff win since 1965 as they beat the Jets in Shea Stadium 31-27. The eventual AFC champion Bengals would end the Bills season the following week, 28-21. An NFL player's strike would shorten the 1982 season, and the Bills would finish 4-5, and five, ending a two-year playoff run. Chuck Knox would leave the Bills to become Seattle's next coach at the end of the year. The famous 1983 draft would be a monumental highlight in Bills history, not due to 12th overall pick tight end Tony Hunter out of Notre Dame. But two picks later, the Bills would draft Jim Kelly, quarterback, Miami, Florida. They also added West Virginia linebacker Daryl Talley in the second. Kelly, who was vocal about not wanting to play for a cold-weather team, signed with the Houston Gamblers of the upstart USFL, where he would play for three seasons. New head coach Kay Stevenson, former Bills quarterback coach and one-time Bills backup quarterback, led the Bills to an 8-8 record in 1983, missing the playoffs. Fred Smurlis and defensive back Steve Freeman would be named to the All-Pro team. The change of helmet color from white to red in 1984 would not prove to be a good luck charm. Not just yet. The Bills would finish 2-14 in consecutive years of 1984 and 1985, not winning one game on the road. 1984 would be the first year of coaching in the NFL for Pete Carroll as he became the Bills' defensive back coach. After giving up a then-record 60 quarterback sacks, Joe Ferguson decided his career in Buffalo would come to an end. With the first pick in the 1985 NFL Draft, the Bills selected defensive end Bruce Smith of Virginia Tech, who would go down as an NFL great. They'd add future Hall of Famer wide receiver Andre Reid of Cutstown State three rounds later. Behind the quarterback tandem of Bruce Matheson and Vince Ferragamo, 
the Bills would only score 200 points in 1985, the lowest of any offense in the 1980s. Head coach Kay Stevenson would be replaced mid-season by defensive coordinator Hank Bullock with similar results. After the USFL disbanded, Jim Kelly finally signed with the Buffalo Bills in 1986. He was welcomed with open arms by the city of Buffalo, and he never looked back. Kelly and the Bills would have themselves quite a journey, but that's a story for next time on the history of the Buffalo Bills. Thank you for listening to the Bills or Bust podcast. I'm Tom Murphy, and let's go Buffalo! Buffalo!